uh, hurry up. Now we have a round table. I'm going to call uh, Luis Andrade, who develops his activities in Rio Grande do Sul, in the Funda Centro. Now we're going to talk about nanotechnology and health, uh, actual uses, and in the next 10, 15 years. Uh, Kawe will be here as a component of our table. I don't have his data because uh, he is going to substitute another professor, Professor Luis Gustavo Simões. Kawe, that is going to substitute him. Uh, Kawe is an engineer, material engineer, and uh, actually currently a researcher of Embrapa, a very synthetic curriculum so that we can uh, uh, go ahead. I would like to, to, to say that the speakers would uh, remain within the 30 minutes, uh, 30 minutes explanation so th that we will not delay anymore. I would like to thank the preference. I would like to uh, explain quickly why you see me here. You're still going to see me again because I, I should be the last one to speak to you uh, uh, w about my theme. But today, uh, when I was coming from Campinas on the plane, Luis Gustavo, who is this a good, great friend of mine, and said that he could not be able to come. So he sent me his presentation for so that I could represent him. And uh, we work to, together with Nanox, and so we know a bit about their work. And I'm going to try to be brief, and we'll skip some of the uh, transparencies. The idea of the nanotechnology in scale, I think you, you have already uh, this notion. What we do not have clearly uh, compared with other sectors how do we classify this? I'm going to use a bit of what Mission Onario talked about, the importance of the algorithm in technology and the difficulty that we're living this, not only in Brazil, but in the world. When we talk about the USPTO, uh, the class 977 uh, creates a limitation that these limitations in nanotechnological should be uh, limited to 100 nanometers. Uh, but th and just this generates a, a confusion what it, of what is uh, nanometrical and what is not na nanotechnological. What is nanotechnological is not necessarily nanometrical. Uh, many times, uh, we have a dimension that has the propriety, but in the microscopes uh, could also be uh, considered as nanotechnology. So we have a difficulty in classifying this. So this has been, I'm not going to talk much about the details to see uh, with the Imetro people today in Brazil, the BNTR that represents the ISO in the com committee Two nine two two nine that uh, are looking for classifications for nanotechnology that will try to clarify the situation. But uh, what they say is that the nanotechnological products will offer something within the products that, with, that have nanoscale. What we have seen in the market, nanotechnology, technological uh, market is that in the scenario in Brazil or in any other place, it goes through a 
S curve in the graph, uh, called as the S curve by economists, that we talk about in a um, period of affirmation of a determined uh, business, then, then you have a quick um, growth and then the stabilization, the consolidation of that industry. But the problem is when the person doesn't have the capital to survive. This is the reality of many uh, companies like Nanox and um, in which the company initially had to maintain itself since its uh, creation in 2005 with, uh, with money that uh, so the company passes through affirmation that, that if there weren't any in state investment that would consolidate the that would consolidate this um, company it would die the second problem is that once consolidated we have to uh, consolidate a market that buys this product what when and if I only have one kind of product, uh, the, the, my company will also die. So consolidate the second group of companies. That w that that is what happened with the second group, which is the buyer, th the purchaser. They had an an, an investment called Fundo Novaro. That that is. Uh, uh, oriented to companies that do not have an historical to consolidate uh, uh, the purchasers. At that time, w when we had a relationship that was near the Nanox people, we saw that the in this case, the specific uh, product were the coatings. The market of the health sector is very extensive, but in it has a characteristics it's always um, high value ag added uh, products that which means that it doesn't have to produce in big scale. I'm saying this because I'm coming back to this theme with a bit more calm to explain to you that these uh, characteristics repeat themselves in the health sector, but also in the small companies that need a qualified market that pays the difference between the small quantity that was pr produced. Uh, uh, in orthopedic in and odontological implants, all these um, markets have a high added value. In the case of uh, Nanox, they they went into this um, coating of orthopedic implements uh, and some of the areas in which they the, w were the coating bio biocompatible um, coatings of the bone integration and this is a market in which the idea of the bacterized coating is very interesting uh, to avoid problems of the contamination during the, the implementation of the prosthetics. And what they showed us some time ago, this idea of the uncoat and they talked about titanium and silver, but it has a big interest in polymeric, polymeric uh, materials. There are many products that are associated, at, like, for example, even the seats where you're sitting today. Sometimes uh, a lot of materials that are the common ones that we're used to. So the idea here is to have an uh, a vis analogous, visual analogous, and where it can be applied, that it will be more distant from our minds. For example, urological catheters, which is today has worked for the market in its big majority. It is made of injectable plastics. And you can note that this is the kind of product that has a high chance of getting taking contamination to inside 
the patient because it goes inside the patient and determined uh, procedures of cle cleanness of every day, day life. Maybe they're not sufficient uh, in benefit of the patient. An exa a, a very interesting example is how this can uh, go into our daily life is when they, it seems uh, curious to, for us to see that many of you are interested in occupational health, but the bacteria, bacterial contamination is a much more serious uh, problem for the doctor or for the dentist than for the patient, because for the patient we have all the cleaning um, care. But w what about the dentist? M m many of the, um, like, TB can be hazardous for dentists. So it would be, we can imagine even the chair of uh, the dentist chair. Uh, it, if this could be rev rev uh, coated with a back bactericide, uh, you could reduce for the dentist and not necessarily for the final uh, consumer, the patient, the risk of contamination. You note that this is a very interesting strategy to go get into the market because who decides the buying this dentist chair is the dentist. I, I never paid attention in the dentist's uh, chair because I always am thinking of him <laughs> when I go to the dentist. So. I was very quick because I know that our time is very short and I would wanted to uh, make an overview for a friend, but with uh, what we know and also uh, provoke a little bit uh, for you to be able to think of in what conditions we can uh, start thinking and the uh, interest interesting use for bactericides materials so that we can talk about this in the in one hour in one hour in the next uh, round table thank you very much i uh, i hope kawe comes back before nine o'clock in the evening i'd like to call now uh for our speech uh, Applica nanotechnology applications and sensors for disease prevention. Sam Haik. He works at the Israel Institute of Technology. Hey, good afternoon, all. Hey. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for the kind invitation. Actually, I came uh, directly from, from the airport uh, to uh, the convention here. And I want to go to talk today about the application of nanotechnology in the diagnosis, screening, and monitoring of cancer, as well as other disease, throughout the so-called exhaled breath namely using non-invasive methods. The whole idea basically, the whole idea basically stems from the fact that there is a lot of uh, devices which are used today for diagnosis, sc screening, and monitoring of cancer. And basically none of these are optimal. For example, if you go to a, make a diagnosis for lung cancer, then there are more than 10 uh, instrumentations, a fact that might uh, indicate that none of them are optimal. If I would like to think about an optimal device which uh, could be utilized very efficiently in the clinic side, I would put a lot of criterions as shown here, and I would like to mention these from the less important to the more important. Basically, the less important, but it's still very important for this device, is that the device should be very easy to use, and also the analysis should be quite easy. I shouldn't be any, a, an expert in order to operate or analyze the results which I get from the device. 
The second criterion which I would love to see in this optimal device is the fact that the device is fast. Fast in terms of giving the results and fast in terms of making the experiment itself. Fast is a, a relative term. And in my opinion, fast is between five minutes to one hour. It's much better than waiting a few days in order to get the results, such as the biopsy in the case of cancer. The other feature which I would love to see in this device is that the device should be inexpensive. And again, this is a relative term. Uh, sometimes $1 million is uh, inexpensive. In my opinion, inexpensive here is up to $5,000, more or less. The fourth feature is that the device should be reliable and, of course, should be portable in order to take it from one side to the other side and could be used for a side bed a diagnosis test. The other criterion which I would love to see in this device is that it is not associated with any risk and it will not require any surgery in order to get the result. For example, biopsy is uh, involved with a surgery. And many other uh, uh, diagnosis methods are rely on radioactive material. I wouldn't like to see any of these in this device. The last and the most important parameter basically is the so-called sensitivity and specificity, namely how much this device is accurate. And I would love to see the highest values in this endeavor. Basically, the non-technology uh, uh, community has been addressing these features in different ways. The way which we address in my laboratories at the Technion basically is based on exhaled breath. The whole idea is to develop a NAND technology and to pack it in a very small box into which the person can exhale for a couple of minutes and then the device can interact the exhaled breath with an array of nanosensors and the results of this interaction will be translated to electrical signal which can be transmitted to pattern recognition method and this way, the device would be able to say whether the person is healthy or a diseased. And in case the person has a disease, what is the type of the, of the disease? Whether it's cancer, kidney disease, liver disease, etc., etc. And for example, if it's cancer, what is the type of the cancer? And much more important, what is the stage of the cancer? Detecting the cancer or the other disease at the very early stages basically can increase the survival rate and therefore we would love to see an early detection or on the other hand to see a screening, namely to screen healthy people and to see whether some of these people has some high risk for a given disease. This device we call it the Nanos and basically the development of the device involves four main phases. The first phase basically is to define what are the volatile biomarkers which are exhaled in the breath and that could be indicative for the type of the disease. For example, the volatile biomarkers which I see in the kidney disease are rather different than those in the cancer disease. And this basically could be done throughout mass spectrometry a, a, a experiments and once are divide, a, defined, we can tailor the nanosensors specifically to detect these volatile biomarkers. And as you can see here, we can synthesize nanomaterials and then integrate them using microelectronics or nanoelectronics fabrication techniques. And once these are done, we can basically integrate the hardware with the software to get the so-called nanos. I should emphasize that the nanos is a device which imitate the canine olfactory system, or the dog nose. Okay, it's the same concept, but here we use electronic device based on nanotechnology. Once we have done with this phase, we go to the lab track phase, where we start to train the device to detect these volatile biomarkers specifically, or to detect or to discriminate between the different types of the disease. Basically, in the case of the cancer, we can train the system to uh, discriminate between healthy and cancer states, different types of cancer, stages of cancer, subtypes of cancer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Again, the training which we are doing for the device is similar to what the police do for the dogs in order to detect explosive materials. Once we uh, have a, su a, a success in this phase, basically we can proceed to the clinical uh, track where we can where we take this device 
to the clinics and we see whether it works in real world confounding factors and we see what is the effect on the screening, diagnosis and monitoring. Today I will give two main examples about the, uh, our achievements in this endeavor. I, I will start with nanoparticles which we have synthesized in our laboratories in order to detect cancer. Basically one of these nanosensors is very simple in terms of concept. Basically, as you can see, these nanoparticles, uh, the black dots, are gold nanoparticles, which are separated from each the other by biomolecules or by a receptor, as could be seen here by the yellow color. Once uh, uh, we have these nanoparticles, we make it the, the position of very thin film between interdigitated electrode. And of course, the, the mechanism, again, in very simplistic way, once the exhaled breath will interact with these layers of nanoparticles, then these volatile biomarkers will enter at the interface between the adjacent nanoparticles, and as a result, they swell the film, namely they increase the distance between the adjacent nanoparticles, and as a result, the tunneling of the electrons from one side to the other side will increase, will decrease, sorry, and as a result, the uh, resistance of the whole film will increase. Basically, by measuring the change in the resistance, we can get our uh, sensing signal. The other way around is the so-called aggregation mechanism, where the biomarkers take uh, uh, the nanoparticles close together, and as a result, the tunneling of the electrons will be shorter, and of course, the resistance will decrease, and again, the change in this resistance will be our sensing signal. Recently, we have shown that uh, each single nanoparticle sensor can respond to a wide variety of concentration and each sensor can uh, uh, respond to a wide variety of volatile biomarkers which appear in the exhaled breath. The detection limit of most of these devices are between one to five ppb part per billion, which is more or less the same level of concentration of those volatile biomarkers which appear in the exhaled breath. In few cases, such as in the black case, we can get detection limit down to few tens of few hundreds of parts per trillion. Very important to see that we can discriminate these volatile biomarkers at the time the same device can be insensitive for water. And this is very important achievement, basically. The exhaled breath include around 85% to 53% relative humidity, and in most sensors in the world, the water can screen the volatile biomarkers which found in the exhaled breath. Therefore, we have found a way how to be sensitive to the volatile biomarkers. At the same time, we can disregard the effect of the water. Building a nanos or electronic nose which build on these principles have shown that we can discriminate between the so-called nonpolar bio biomarkers and polar biomarkers. And as could be seen here, we could discriminate even between different volatile organic compounds which are similar to each the other, such as n-heptan, n-hexan, and n-octan. And even we can discriminate between n-octan and isoctan, basically the isomer of the same molecule. Please note that the same a, a given point on the graph in a given color and given shape is the repetition of the a, experiment again and again just to assure that we have re reproducibility. And as you can see, the results are just great. And we can discriminate between the whole situations very nicely. And of course, we can discriminate the a, a volatile biomarkers according to their dipole moment. Until now, this is you know, just an introduction. I will move right now to the clinical study. This is a lab track, the so-called lab track. We take the electronic nose to a real hospital and see what happens with real patients. And in this context, we, uh, we have recruited many uh, patients as well as healthy people as a reference. And from each pe uh, person, we uh, ask the person to excel into a given device which we have developed in our lab. This device can discriminate between the dead space, namely that breath which comes from the tongue and the uh, mouth, which includes a lot of contaminants, and can discriminate it from alveolar breath, namely the breath which comes from the lungs, which includes the signature of the disease. 
Once we obtain the alveolar breath, we run, a, a, we analyze the, re the results using the nanos, which looks uh, today this way. It's not similar to nose, but you know, it's called nanos. And in parallel, we have compared with mass spectrometry in order to get the nature of and the composition of the volatile biomarkers. In our first study before two and a half years, in collaboration with the Rambam Hospital, we have taken a population of 40 patients with lung cancer at stage four and three, namely advanced stages. All of them have non-small cell lung cancer, and we compared them with 56 healthy volunteers. Please note that all of these patients were non-smokers at the time of the experiment, even though part of them were ex-smokers, part of them, of course, were uh, have taken some medication <coughs> as shown here. The healthy people which we compared to were uh, a part of them were smokers and the other part were ex-smokers and of course again there was a lot of confounding factors as shown here in the additional data. By exposing both types of samples to the same device we have got that the signals which are obtained from the healthy people are shown here in green uh, color, are rather different or rather discriminated from the signals which are found from real lung cancer breath, an indication that we can discriminate throughout exhaled breath between lung cancer people and healthy people only by exhalation. Of course, we have extended our study and found the most important four or five biomarkers, which can give more than 89% of the signal. This was published uh, in Nature Nanotechnology, so if you like to see a reference further. The main disadvantage of this study, this study was focused more on the technology, technology side, but the main disadvantage that we have focused on the advanced stages of the disease. At the time, we would like in real application to see the early stages of the uh, cancer, because once we detect the early stages, we can increase the survival rate from 15% to more than 90 uh, to more than 70%, uh, which is a huge amount of uh, results. And therefore, we have uh, uh, extended our studies and we have taken people with lung cancer at stage one to stage four, and the same results we have got more or less. And even much, much more important, we have shown that we could discriminate between healthy people and people who has dysplasia. What is dysplasia? Dysplasia, it's a pre-malignant tumor. Basically, it's a healthy cell which started to change its shape and density. And basically, every person or smoker who has this dysplasia would develop a lung cancer within 10 to 15 years. Namely, we can predict by the nanos those people who will develop in the uh, far future within 10 to 15 percent who will get a lung cancer or not. So this is one of the important results which we have achieved with these results. The other question which was stemmed, of course, whether we can discriminate not only lung cancer from healthy people, but rather we can discriminate different cancers from each to the other. And therefore, we have taken 177 volunteers, and all of these volunteers uh, had, part of them had lung cancer, the other part had breast cancer, the other part has prostate cancer, and a, a significant part has colorectal cancer. And all of these we have exposed to the same device, and we try to see whether we can discriminate between those people using our nanosensors. At the level of a given nanosensor, individual nanosensor, as you can see, we could discriminate very nicely between the different stages, different types of the cancer, as well as to discriminate them from healthy people. If we take the whole population which we have examined by this study and which was published very recently also, we could discriminate between healthy people and lung cancerous people as I have shown earlier, but more we could discriminate between the different types of the cancer, between uh, breast cancer, colorectal cancer, and prostate cancer. Please note that all the population here were at stages one to four. It was very heterogeneous, included advanced as well as very early stages of the cancer. So this is basically a very promising results and today we are extending our studies to include more than 6,000 patients for namely women who don't have any tumor, whether benign or malignant. And in the category of the uh, 
in the category of the malignant tumors, we could discriminate between different types of the malignant tumor. Again, everything from excelled breath. If you could read the statistics here, the p-value, you can see that the p-value are excellent, namely indicating that statistically these results are quite robust. An important result which we have achieved that we were not sensitive to confounding factors, namely the age, gender, place of birth, uh, uh, ethnicity, family cancer history, food additive, smoking, etc., etc., didn't affect our results. Basically, they affected our results, but we could elaborate our algorithm so we can put these effects aside, and indeed, we succeeded to do this here. Of course, um, uh, you might uh, ask the question what we see in each cancer type and therefore we have done mass spectrometry uh, uh, experiments and as you can see we could discriminate that in the lung cancer we have a pattern namely a group of volatile biomarkers which could be discriminated between the lung cancer and the healthy people the nature of these volatile biomarkers book one to six are known if you would like you can refer to the uh, paper and see their chemical nature and composition. But please note that the volatile biomarkers which are, uh, could identify the lying cancer are rather different than those which identify the colorectal cancer and breast cancer and prostate cancer. Namely, the, the volatile biomarkers are rather different and depends on the type and the stage of the disease per se. Again, further, uh, further uh, uh, data you can find in the published uh, results. Another uh, very interesting uh, approach is that what would happen if we expose the device directly to the cancer cell, not throughout the cell breath, but for example in a surgery room, we take the tumor and we expose it to, a, to the nanos to see what is the histology of the device or to correlate it with the histology of the device. And here we could see that we couldn't discriminate only between lung cancer and healthy people, but rather we could subcategorize the lung cancer. And in this case, we could see that we have discriminated quite nicely between the so-called non-small cell lung cancer and small cell lung cancer. And of course, we could discriminate them from a, a, a mortal a, a cells. And in this category of the non-small cell lung cancer, we could further subcategorize the categories and we could discriminate between squamous cell carcinoma and adenocarcinoma. Maybe this is too much clinical uh, uh, language, but to, uh, to say it in uh, much simpler words, these results indicate that we can help the uh, uh, physician to make a targeted therapy for each cancer based on these results. I wouldn't give a chemotherapy, which is general for all cancerous people, but by knowing the result, or the subtype of the cancer, I can give targeted therapy, uh, which can be much more efficient and uh, much more uh, convenient to the, uh, uh, to the person. The second uh, uh, example, which I will show, and the last one, of course, is the diagnosis of renal failure, kidney disease, basically, by breath samples. And in this study, we have started from rat models, where we have connected the nanos directly to the rat trachea, and we have taking the breath directly into the nanos and we got the results online on the screen. In this case, we have utilized two types of rats, healthy rats and rats that we have induced the kidney disease by taking out the two kidneys and waiting 48 hours, as could be indicated here by the different <laughs> biomarkers. And in this case, we haven't used nanoparticles, but rather we tailored our sensors towards those volatile biomarkers which appear in the kidney disease. And as could be seen here, we used networks of carbon and tubes which are coated with organic monolayers. Uh, and with these uh, uh, sensors, we have shown that we could discriminate between healthy rats and rats that have a kidney disease or severe kidney disease. The results were quite discriminated from each the other and very nicely separated. Much more important, we have proceeded further and we have done a clinical study with real patients in the hospital and we have collected around 140 uh, samples from people and again, we could see that we could discriminate between chronic renal failure and healthy people. Good results, but the nicer result basically is not this one, but rather this one, is that we could discriminate between the different stages of the kidney disease 
as could be seen here, we could discriminate between stage two of the kidney disease from stage three, from stage four, and from stage five. This is very important results because once we catch the disease at stage two or three, we can slow down the progress of the disease. We cannot reverse it or uh, uh, bring it back, unfortunately, but we can slow it down uh, uh, and uh, increase the time until getting to the dialysis. The last uh, results which we have got in this endeavor is the acute renal failure. What is acute renal failure? Basically, it's a kidney disease which uh, stem from a, an accident or toxicity, and it, did it, uh, and it don't develop over years, but rather over days. And as could be seen here, uh, the main problem in the acute renal failure that it can be detected only after, uh, after 48 hours uh, from the induction of the disease. For example, if we take the, uh, vault, if the biomarker, which is called creatinine, which are used today in the hospitals, it can start to change only after 48 hours in the case of the acute renal failure. At the time, if we detect the volatile biomarkers from the exhaled breath, we can see changes even uh, after the second hour and the 20 hours, et cetera, et cetera. Namely, again, here, this is a great evidence that we can discriminate uh, the disease at the very early stages and where we can increase the survival rate from uh, the exhaled breath. Before four years, when I came back from Caltech, I took the Technion and uh, uh, gave my first presentation, I wrote this sentence. We're still at the beginning, but the future seems promising. And today I, uh, I am here in Brazil and talking about the same topic and again, the same sentence. The more we go deep uh, inside this field of volatile biomarkers and diagnosis, the more questions we have and the more challenges we have. And I see that we have really very fascinating results, but really we have much more questions to answer. And I hope in the next few years, we could, my team and I, could uh, uh, make a, a further uh, advance in this endeavor. With this, I end my uh, uh, talk, and thank you for your attention and for invitation. Thank you very much.